Growth is a sign of life. No life, no growth. No growth, no life. And everyone who is alive here today, and I think that includes everyone in the room, probably, is the result of two very important events. That's birth and growth. You are the result of a physical birth, and that was followed by physical growth. And it's the same story when it comes to the spiritual side of things. If you are a follower of Christ, if you consider yourself a Christian here, it's because you have experienced what the Bible calls a new birth. And you may remember it from last chapter. It was 1 Peter 1, verse 3. It said it so well. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so it can certainly be said that the Christian life is not just about that new birth, but it's also about new growth. And whether it's in the physical or in the spiritual, not all growth that we go through is automatic, and not all of it is easy. Some growth can be very painful. And growth takes courage. And growth takes encouragement. And that's why I titled tonight's teaching from 1 Peter 2, Encouraged to Grow. And as you can see from this slide here, the word encouraged actually contains another word, and that is the word courage. The word encouraged in its literal meaning is to be infused with courage, to be given strength. And so God knows that we need to be encouraged to grow, that some growth is just going to happen with or without courage, with or without encouragement. But there are times, there are periods, there are places in our life where we're going to need courage to grow because gr with that growth comes growing pains. So when you think about growth, well, it can include things like stretching, straining, bending, breaking, the pain of change, the pain of progress, it can take some grinding along the way for us to grow. And we see that painful growth process right there in the author of First Peter. You may remember as Pastor Pedro gave that introduction in the life of Peter, just kind of hitting some of the high and low lights of his life, Peter was a man who grew. We first met Peter in Matthew, but now toward the back of the book, toward the back of the Bible, First and Second Peter, we're going to see a man, well, you would hardly recognize him from the early Peter. He's not the same Peter. He has changed. He has matured. He grew. And it was a painful process. Now, I don't know about you, but occasionally I've thought whether or not I would want to be in the Bible. I'm not sure I would want to be a Bible character because their flaws are right out there for all of us to see. And so we get to see Peter in all of his glory sometime. He had that painful process of growth, and he got to do it very publicly through all eternity, an example sometimes of failure, of mistakes, of missteps, and misspoken things, setbacks along the way. But out of the other end of all of that, that meat grinder there, Peter is a leader. He's an example. He is an inspiration. And so Peter now is encouraging others to grow. And he knows it takes courage to grow. It did for him, it does for us. And Peter is able to speak in a very unique way because he is qualified, certainly, to say from personal experience on the subject of personal growth, spiritual growth, hey, if God can do it for me, he can certainly do it for you. And so as you look closely again at this title slide here, what you're going to see is that's an x-ray image of a baby in the womb. You have to look kind of, you know, with the baby lying on their back there, but you see the outline of the face there. Some of you are still saying, I don't see it. It looks like a lima bean. That's what that is. That's a baby there. Nice, peaceful place in the womb, right? Some growing goes on there. No big stresses and all that. But now let's look at the next slide. And what you're going to see there is a picture of a broken leg, and that is supported by pins and rods and wires there that are bolted to the bone. Now, what do these x-rays have to do with each other, and what do they have to do with 1 Peter 2? Well, if you're taking notes or you're thinking these things through carefully, the main message tonight, life is not just about birth. It's about growth. 
and both can be quite painful. See, the slide here is actually a picture of our son Stephen's leg, and it was taken last week, immediately after his surgery. Now, many of you have asked even tonight and at various times during the week, how is he doing? Well, you'll get to ask him. He's right over there sometime. You can ask him later. But what you're going to see is that these were taken right after his surgery. Now, I didn't show the color pictures because some of you might be a little squeamish. You know, we sent them out to some folks and they're, you know, making their way around the internet and all that sort of thing. But they're a little bit graphic. Let's just put it that way. But if you like that sort of thing, if you like to get grossed out, well, you can go see Stephen's leg in all its gory glory after the service here. <laughs> but, but Stephen here, he is having his leg lengthened and strengthen. Now, if you think about that, you say, that sounds like a painful process. Yes, it does, and it is. He was born with one leg shorter than the other. Okay, that's a whole story unto its own. That's for another teaching. But he was born with one leg shorter than the other. And from birth, we knew that Stephen's body, his bones, at some point, were going to have to be encouraged to grow. They wouldn't just do what they were supposed to do automatically. There was going to have to be a time that Stephen would have to make, have the courage to make a choice. What was that choice? Well, I'm going to have to grow and it isn't going to be automatic and it isn't going to be easy. And last week the surgeon broke the two bones in our son's lower leg. Now, I'm not going to go into any more detail and not think that through too much. I've thought it through a lot. It kept me up at night several nights. But he then put a strong metal cage around it and bolted it through the bones there and, and connected that all with rods and wires and everything else. Now, over the next couple of months, this is where it really gets good. It starts tomorrow, actually, this part of it. People have asked, how'd the surgery go? Well, we'll know over the next few months as we turn these little screws every day that will adjust that cage. That will eventually result, we trust, in about four centimeters of bone growth in that leg. Now, after the lengthening will come the strengthening. And so eight more months he will spend in that cage or so as the bone is now healing and growing solid enough to be stood on on its own. And at that point, the brace can be removed. Now, this is going to be, as you can imagine, a painful process, pain all throughout it in various ways, and a very slow progress there. Now, some of you are saying, Pastor Scott, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're not encouraging me to grow. You're not encouraging me at all. This should be called discouraged to grow. You know, that should be the title of this teaching. Well, stay tuned to it. Because here's the thing. Again, that word inside, courage. That's what I want to do is in some way help us realize that it is going to take courage, but God will give us the courage to grow. There's going to be times in our life where we are going to need encouragement. We are going to need to be infused with courage to go forward, to grow forward, to continue on in this Christian life. And so what I want to do here is, again, give some lessons learned from the physical to the spiritual. Jesus loved to do that, to tell parables, physical truths that really illustrated spiritual realities that were so much more important. And so that's what I'm going to do here tonight. God used the experiences of the last week to encourage me to, to keep growing spiritually to teach me lessons about the courage that it does take to keep going, to keep growing through the painful process of progress in our life. So knowing I would be teaching this chapter tonight, I was reading there through 1 Peter several different times. And you'll know if you know that book that it is a book about triumphing over trials. It is a book that was written to those who were experiencing incredible, excruciating, painful hardships in their life. Not just going through adversity, though, they were growing through it. That's really what God wants in our life. And so, as always, God has perfect timing. And so my section to teach tonight is 1 Peter chapter 2, the first 10 verses there. And we will see tonight that it's all about spiritual growth. That's what this chapter's about. It's about how growth happens and it's about how growth is hindered in our life. What are the things that would cause us to be stunted in our growth? And so two days after this surgery here, the doctor came into the room with a bunch of interns. Maybe you've been uh, somewhere in a hospital. I think this is always one of the wonderful things about a hospital. You know, you're there wearing this gown that, well, let's just say doesn't cover all the material. And then in comes a classroom to learn about you and you're the subject you know I can remember uh, surgery that I had and well they were just uh, all observing it and it was just kind of not the most pleasant of things 
And so here we have this group come in, and Stephen is exhibit A for them. And so the doctor goes into full description of Stephen's problem, his issue, and then the solution. And he walked through all of it. It was amazing for me to listen. I was listening very, very closely, at least as closely as I could on a few hours sleep. And so suddenly I realized, bing, you know what? This doctor is saying some stuff that's more than physical. There's something spiritual here, some lessons that can be learned about birth and about growth. And the next couple of nights there, I thought through these things. And they seem very, very profound, at least at the time. Now, again, I don't know if you've ever been sleep deprived. Everything seems profound. You know, you go, oh, I think I've solved the uh, issues of the universe. And then you wake up and go, oh, I've, I don't know what it had something to do with broccoli. I have no idea what that, why that seems so profound at the time. But see, if you'll look at the very first word there, 1 Peter 2, I think you'll see there are some thoughts here that God has dropped in this section. What is it? Well, it starts again with the word therefore, and we always ask, what is it therefore whenever we see that? You don't start a thought with therefore, it points to what came before. So what came before? Well, Pastor Pedro taught on it last week, and he left these few verses in chapter 1 for me to discuss because they really go together with the first part here of chapter 2. And so the therefore in verse 1 actually points to what came before verses 22 through 24. So let me just start there with you in verse 22 of chapter 1. And just have this word in your mind, birth. Okay, birth, that's what it's going to talk about here. It says, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. Here it is. Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away. But the word of God endures forever. Now this is the word by which the gospel was preached to you. So again, stopping right there, what you see, Peter talking about birth. He's talking about physical birth. He's talking about spiritual birth. And the contrast there is found in verse 23 with those words corruptible and incorruptible. You see it, corruptible seed, incorruptible seed. And see, the corruptible seed is talking about the physical birth that we all have had here. The physical life of man, though, it fades. That's what it says. It says it fizzles, it withers, it dies. Okay, it doesn't last forever. But then you see the incorruptible seed. What's that talking about? Well, it says the word of God lives and abides forever. Okay, so it is an eternal seed. Now, for you note takers, I'm going to give a few thoughts here, some main thoughts, and then we'll move on into the rest of the chapter. The first one is what the Word of God does. The Word corrects defects. Corrects defects. That is what the Word of God does. Now, you might be saying defects. What do you mean? What are you talking about? Well, spiritually speaking, we were all born with a deadly defect. The Bible sums it up with that word sin. Little bitty word, big implication. What is it? Well, this is a defect so deep in the human race. The only way to correct that defect is to be born again. That's what the Bible says. It's like God has to start over in a life. It's not enough just for a person to get a physical start. They have to have a whole new start. That defect so deep, that's what it is. To start over with a new heart, a new mind, a whole new life. And so Jesus referred to that as being born again, and that's exactly what Peter is picking up on right here. Again, that fact that we were all born, every single one of us, no matter how good we may look on the outside or how perfect we may pretend to be, we all have a spiritual birth defect, a corruptible seed. Adam's sin was passed on to his son. We got it through Adam, and it just keeps going that way. We wither, we fade, that's what we see. No matter how hard you try, that is where we are headed. That's the problem. We have a defect. But the Word of God corrects our defects. See, that's the solution. And the solution here, he says it right here, we must be born again. It's not something corruptible. See, what God is doing is planting something incorruptible inside a person's life. When they accept the Word of God, when they embrace the truths of God, and in that, God says, I will come and live inside that life. He will actually infuse eternal life 
into this shell that's just withering and fading away. But that process is not automatic. We have to have a spiritual rebirth. A pure soul, a pure heart, he talks about there, a pure spirit. How does it happen again? The only pure and perfect thing there is, which is the Word of God and the God of the Word. That's what we need. And so, again, as you look at this, so often, as has been said from this pulpit before, people will ask out there, well, are you one of them born-again Christians? You know, as if there was some other type. There is no other type. Someone is either born again and therefore a Christian or not born again and therefore not a Christian. There is no other way to get in. It's not like a, a little subset, you know, or an uh, elite group or something like that. No, it's the very way that Jesus said it happens in every life. And so to be born again is to have the eternal word of God planted in your heart. And we don't have eternal life naturally. We don't have it physically. We don't have it automatically. God gives it to those who ask him. And if you have never done that, tonight is your night to do it. What an amazing opportunity God gives us here today. It says there in verse 25, if you look at it with me, through the gospel preached. What is the gospel? Well, the gospel means literally good news. But see, the good news is really good. Why? Because the bad news is really bad. See, as God, that surgeon, comes and looks at our life, he says, you have a deadly defect. Well, that's bad news. What's the solution? He says, well, that's the good news. I have the solution. The bad news is you're a sinner, and sin leads to death. You're born with a fatal flaw a heart defect, a messed up mind. You know, and, and the longer you live with that, the more it'll be manifested. You'll see it. And others will see it too. So what do we need? We need a transplant, a divine transplant, a new heart, a new life, a new soul, all of that. That's the good news. Jesus says, that's what I'll give you. God will give the new birth to anyone who comes to me. For me, that happened in 1993. What does that mean? If you do the math, it means I'm a rebellious teenager in the Lord right now. So that's uh, explaining some of my behavior when I look at things. I say, well, I'm just in my angst period right now, Lord. But, you know, you look at this, and, and tonight can be your night to become maybe a baby. And you say, well, do I want to do that? Well, that's what Jesus said. It starts with birth. Everyone's growth spiritually has to start with birth. It has to start there. And so that's not the end of the story. We should know that, right? We look at it physically and we know birth isn't the end of the story. It's the beginning of something wonderful, which is the opportunity to grow. And so once there is birth, spiritually, inevitably, if that birth is true, then there is going to be growth that follows that birth. And it may come as a shock to many Christians. Maybe you're here tonight and you're uh, new in the faith or, or maybe you've been taught certain things that aren't true and the Bible makes it so clear that this is the facts here, it comes as a shock to many Christians that even after we're born again, we still have defects. We still have defects? Yeah, see, even though we make a choice to follow Jesus, well, that's going to correct a defect, which is the fact that we are headed to hell. You know, we are separated from God and condemned because of our sin. Well, that, that defect gets corrected the moment you're born again. But guess what? We're still living on in the flesh. And so there are still other defects to correct along the way, and that's exactly what the Word of God does. Let me use the analogy this way, again, returning to the story here of Stephen, our son. By God's grace, he did not have a life-threatening defect at birth. You know, he, he was going to live and, and going to live on fine. Uh, but he did have some issues, some problems. You might call what he had a growth threatening defect, a, a defect that would affect his growth in his life. And so it would have left his legs uneven. Now, he could have gone through his life perfectly fine with that. You know, maybe many of you in the room may have different things that you've just learned to live with, and you say, well, that's a defect, but I'm not going to correct it. I'll just live with it, and that's okay too. But, you know, we could have left him in that way. But you know what? It would have caused some other problems. The doctors, we discussed it with different people, and they said, you know what? As he gets older, especially, if he's not even Stephen, he's going to have a lot of problems, you know? <laughs> he's going to be, you know, paying a price later. So this was a difficult decision, again, for a 14-year-old to make. But it's a decision he had to make. We couldn't make it for him. It's a decision he had to make because it's a decision he has to live with. But it's a decision to say, you know what, I'm going to have some short-term pain for some long-term gain. And so 
you know, that's what they did. They said, we're going to make even Stephen. The type of growth, though, here, it's not going to be the kind that maybe he got early in life where it's just you just feed them and they grow. Hey, it's nice, you know, easy. This one was going to take some courage. The body's going to have to be encouraged to grow. It won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. That's the decision we made. And here's the analogy, and here's the application that I'm hoping we'll hear here in this room. I know I am listening as the Lord says it. In your own life, in your Christian walk, this moment will come, maybe multiple times. But there will be times in our life when we realize, you know what the easy part of the growth? I think it's over. You know, some of the stuff that was just kind of automatic, well, that's already happened. You know, maybe the birth, you know, coming to the Lord, though it had its own pain, I think it was more pain for the Lord than for me. I, I, that was wonderful. Hey, I'm, I'm born again. My life is new. But you know what? Growing pains, oh, those, are, those can be kind of hard sometimes. You know, and so giving your life to Jesus, well, you can have that. I'm forgiven, I'm free, I'm heaven bound. That's awesome. But there comes a moment when you realize, man, I'm still uneven in some areas. I'm still stunted in my growth sometimes. I am in need of adjustment. And maybe many of you in, in the room are starting to come to that point, starting to come to that realization in your life. You've been born again, you know you're forgiven, you know you're heaven bound, but somehow you hit a plateau and you say, I don't know. I don't know what I need to do to grow. It's like, it's like I hit the wall there. I want to choose to change. I want to continue to mature. I want to go further than I have. I see some others who maybe their lives have gone on past where I have grown spiritually. I want to break this barrier. But you don't know how to grow past this point. Well, again, I would direct you, and I would direct myself in this case, to the spiritual surgeon. Well, the same one who gives us birth spiritually can give us growth spiritually. And that's what God is. He's got the ultimate set of tools. Whatever it is that we're facing, he can fix it. And God's work in our life, well, I like to say it this way. It's a point and it's a process. What does that mean? Well, it's a point. Hey, I, I'm no more saved today than I was in 1993. I was saved when Jesus forgave my sin when I put my faith in him. But hey, the growth... That's a process. He left me here on the earth. He didn't whisk me away to heaven immediately. Why? Because there was growth. There were some things that he wanted to do in my life and through my life. And the same is true of you. So the point, well, that's the birth. But the process, that's the growth. And so this is what brings us to 1 Peter 2, verse 1. The growth, the growth process. He says there in verse 1, Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speaking, as newborn babes desire the pure milk of the word, that you may grow thereby, if indeed you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now again, I start off by saying that the word corrects defects. You know, that's kind of a big picture thing. God fixes a lot of stuff right there at that point of salvation. But again, there's a process by which he wants to correct some other defects. Maybe some things that we hold on to a little bit more and a little bit longer. And so this brings me to the second major point tonight, which is the word, it can do an infection inspection. An infection inspection. Now, one of the biggest challenges with Stephen's type of surgery, just so you know, is the risk of infection. It's, uh, it's a danger anytime you have a wound there. But the idea of bacteria, it's not the seen things, it's the unseen things, the microscopic messes that are all around us. And it's kind of like this. As you look down this list, he talks about malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy. And you think, are those really the biggest problems in a person's life? Well, maybe not the biggest problem in an unbeliever's life. Their biggest problem is they're separated from God, and if they don't turn around, they're going to be separated from God for all eternity. That's a big defect. But sometimes when we come to the Lord, hey, there's still some things that need correcting. And you look at these. These are all issues of the heart, and they will delay the growth process. If you have plateaued in some way in your life, and you say, I just can't grow beyond this point, I can't go beyond this point, maybe it's because you're growing bitter rather than better through the challenges of life. And because of that, well, that's what you see there coming out of that. Malice and slander and envy and all these things, comparing yourself to others. Well, why did God break my leg and he didn't break that person's leg? And why do I have to go through this and they don't have to go through that? That sort of thing. 
The surgeon there spent a lot of time with us as parents telling us how to keep the wounds clean and making sure that we knew the importance of that. And that's what God's word is teaching us here as he's saying, you know what, if you want to go through growth, well, you're going to get wounded in life, but you got to know how to not let those things grow infected. You have to know how to keep those things clean. You got to know how to do divine wound care. If you want to grow spiritually, if you want God's surgery to be successful in your life, hey, keep it clean. Keep it clean. Keep your heart, your mind free of malice and deceit and hypocrisy and envy and evil speaking. Just lay it aside. All those words there in verse 1 will hinder spiritual growth in your life. And I know life can wound you. I mean, I can say for sure there are hurt people in this room. You know, somebody has hurt you somewhere along the line. And somebody out there has something you wish you had. There's somebody's life who you could look on and go, well, why is mine so hard and theirs is so easy? You know, and we can grow very, very hardened in life if we're not careful. But God isn't wanting us to grow bitter. He's wanting us to grow better through these things. And how do we do it? Well, not through spiritual shortcuts, not through hypocrisy, not through pretending to be something we're not. No, see, the danger of infection is, is so real that God says, you need my word. My word will do an infection inspection. That's one of the reasons we stay away from God's word sometimes, frankly, isn't it? Because it hurts. I mean, when we do the wound care, one of the things Stephen says is, ow! You know, but it's helping him. It's hurting him, but it's helping him. Why? Because that unseen enemy of those bacteria are being taken out. So the danger of infection in your life, sin will stunt your growth like nothing else will. Psalm 119, I love the way one of the verses puts it. It's the longest psalm in the Bible. I'm not going to tell you which verse it is, so maybe you'll go read them all. But it says, how can a young man keep his way pure? He says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I would not sin against you. So that's that inspection to say, hey, is there an infection in my life, in my heart? Am I growing bitter? The pure milk of the word, see, it builds bones. You know, it's good for the bones. Prevents infection. The washing of the water of the word, actually, there. Keeping it clean. That's what he's encouraging us to do. So, first of all, we see the word corrects defects. It gives that infection inspection. But here comes the third one. This is really the big one for me tonight. Which is, the word, it gives stability ability. Stability, ability. What am I saying there? You're able to be stable when you have the Word of God at the root of your life, at the core of your life. See, I don't need to tell you. I'm not informing you anything you don't already know. And the longer you've lived, probably the more you know it. Life is hard. And the flesh alone is not going to sustain you. You know, you're going to be all sloppy. If you, imagine yourself born without bones. You know, you need bones, right? God knew that. You need strength. You need something to make you stable. And that is exactly what the Word of God does in a person's life. It gives stability. It gives the ability to be stable even when everything around you is going crazy. And again, I don't say that because it's a theory that I read somewhere. It is the gracious experience of our family this week, as certainly we have had one of the harder weeks of our life. And there's so much I could say about the Bible, but tonight this is what I want to say, which is just how God used His Word this week to give us that stability, ability, and the way that He wants to do it in your life. Why? Because this isn't all about our family or our son. This is about your life, your friends, your family, what we need to go through this together. Because I know in every one of these seats, there's a story. There's some stories that could outdo ours, of course. But what you see is as we go through these things, we need that ability for stability. And so have you ever heard Christians say, I, I got a verse from God. God gave me a verse. You know, I never said, like, how? Like, did he mail it to you or email it or what? What does that mean exactly? Well, this is at least a way that it works. This is one of the ways it worked in our life. Now, I don't know why, but God gives my wife a lot more verses than he gives me. I don't know. He just does. It's kind of a thing that we have, and that's the way it is. But my wife told me the morning of the surgery, God gave me some verses. And I'm like, cool. Well, he could have given me some, but okay. He gave them to me through you. That's cool. Well, she said, 
God keeps giving me verses about eagles as it relates to Stephen, you know, as it relates to this and as it relates to his life. You know, just in general, verses about eagles. Let me give you a couple examples here. Isaiah 40, verse 31. This is a, a quote from it here. It says, But those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I like that stuff in there as my son's doing these things with his leg about walking and not fainting. You know, I was worried about that. I'm not really big into blood, you know. And so Exodus 19.4, another one. God's saying to the, the people of Israel there, he says, I bore you up on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, this is the cool part. Lynn read the, the devotional comment there on these verses in the Bible. And this is what it said in her study Bible. It, it talked about how eagles teach their young to fly. I don't know if you know about this, but eagles, they build their nests, of course, way up high on these cliffs, you know. And so they can't exactly take these little flying lessons, you know, like in a... It, it's a nice, safe place. So what they do is they actually, at some point, push the little eaglets out of the nest. Just whoop, over the side. And this thing, mm, you know, making the dive bomb there. They flap, they fumble, they fall, you know, all the rest of this. And right before they hit the ground, in comes Mama or Papa Eagle, up, bearing them up on eagle's wings so that they would not fall and fail completely. The eagle swoops in and catches them. All this a part of the process of the growth that follows birth, encouraging them to grow. And you can imagine if you're the eaglet in the nest thinking, I'm going to call the cops. The, you know, my parents are abusing me or whatever. When trials come, you know, there God is pushing us out of the nest. And we're flapping and we're flailing and we're saying we're going to fall. And you hate me, God. You hate me. That's why you're doing this to me. And he's saying, nah. I'm not trying to kill you. I'm not trying to hurt you. I just know you need to be encouraged sometime to grow. Because if you had your way, you'd stay in that little comfort zone forever. And you'd never know what it is to fly. And so there, again, God giving us this verse about eagles, you know, not just for Stephen, but for us too, because we're struggling, you know. And I called the church here, and they knew it was me, you know, but I always try to play jokes on people here. It's just part of what we do as a staff, you know. And I said, hi, um, my teenage son, he's really into body piercing, and um, I'm pretty sure he's on drugs right now, and... Um, I'm wondering if you could maybe have the youth pastor come and, and, and visit him. You know, we're over at Jackson Hospital or whatever. So they knew it was me, you know, and they said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so Pastor Jose and his son came to visit Stephen there in the hospital. And you know what they brought with them on, on top of about a boatload of candy and sugar and everything else? A pocket knife with an eagle on it. Now, here's the thing. Lynn didn't say anything about eagles to Jose, but I guess God did. See, they have the same God. That's what's cool. When we have the same God, God can communicate to us in different ways. And when we saw that, she had already told me, God's saying something to us about eagles. God's given us these verses of hope that he's going to walk and he's going to run and we're not going to faint. We're going to make it through this. Wow. In comes a brother to give that encouragement. See, that's the stability ability that God wants to give us through the word of God. And not just us, but through each other. That's how it really works. That's what's so cool. God's speaking to you. And God's speaking through you. And you know what he would say to you? The same thing he said to us. I'm not hurting you. I'm helping you. Oh, but it hurts. I know, but it's helping. And the pure milk of the word of God, it has that scalpel ability, you know? That ability to cut just right in a way that hurts. Yeah, it hurts. But it hurts the minimum it needs to to help. And so the pure milk of the word of God, good for the bones. Now, this is a huge truth coming here in the teaching for me. It was the real revelation that day for me. Again, profound on a few hours sleep. I'm hoping it'll be uh, profound for you here tonight. But picture the interns. Again, this, this is a seasoned doctor who's done this for years and years and years. And these interns are even, you can see them kind of looking at it like, 
<gasps> Am I going to have to do that someday and stuff like that? But they got their little notebooks and they're taking their crazy notes and I'm doing the same, you know, writing down on a piece of paper the things he's saying. Because I'm thinking, hey, he's giving me the teaching. This is awesome. And then <laughs> this surgeon says this. He, he'd, he'd stop and the way he'd teach is he'd say something and then he'd stop and ask them. And he says, now when a bone has stopped growing prematurely, when, when there's additional growth needed, and you need to experience that new growth, and the, the growth usually happens at the end. That's how it works, you know, the bone. Uh, what do you have to do? And he calls on one of the guys, and he's like, uh, break it? <gasps> yeah, yeah, yes, you have to break it. That's what the, the guy says. And this is what the doctor, this came right out of, his, out of his mouth like this. New growth only occurs in the broken places. <gasps> That's what happened in my life when I heard that. New growth only occurs in the broken places. See, that's exactly how the surgery works. It's taking advantage of the fearful and wonderful way in which God created our bodies. It's amazing how anyone could think this is just an accident or just a modified monkey. I have no idea how anyone could believe this. Well, if you hang around here on Friday nights or you come to the loud concert at the youth group, you might think that. But, but this is how the surgery works. The bones are broken, and they want to fuse. They want to fix. They want to heal right away, as quickly as possible. They immediately start trying to fix the problem. And if all you wanted to do was fix a broken bone, that's exactly what you do. You set it, and as quickly as it can heal, that's great. And you get the cast off, and everything's... Fine like that. But if you want to lengthen the bone, well, that's a different story. What do you have to do? You have to refuse to fuse. You have to refuse to fuse. You have to turn the screws like this is going to start happening tomorrow. Again, you want to pray for something? Pray for him, but pray for us. We've got to turn the screws in this thing. Now, it's not going to happen all at once. That wouldn't work. It's going to be little by little. A fraction of a millimeter at a time, almost imperceptible to anyone other than Stephen. <laughs> okay? What do you do? Growth, weight, and this is the tough part, walk. See, some of you say, oh, man, he's here tonight. He's such a great kid. Uh, you know, cr wow, he's walking. This is doctor's orders. He needs to walk on it. Always staying just slightly ahead of the process. What is the spiritual lesson here? Well, here it is. Progress is a process. Progress is a process in our life, and it is a painful process that takes some time, and it takes load-bearing. See, God knows how to make us grow, and I'm always looking for spiritual shortcuts. I don't know about you, but I'm like, how can we speed up this process a little? You know, how can we make it in big leaps and bounds? You know, how can I wake up one day with a longer, stronger faith, you know? That's what I want, Lord. And this is his word to me. I'm going to break it, and you're going to walk on it. What? You're going to break what? And I'm going to walk on what? Exactly the point here, load-bearing, the purpose of this frame, the pins, the rods there. This wasn't to hurt him additionally. This was to help him. It was to make it possible for Stephen to walk and put weight on that broken bone there. That's what makes the bone know to grow. It's just a little signal to it. Hey, this is still being used, you know. This is going to need to grow some. And if all Stephen did was lie around all day, feeling sorry for himself with his leg in the air, having all us wait on him, there would be no growth. Less pain maybe, but certainly less gain. And so the bone would heal, but there'd be no better than the beginning. He would have gone through all that pain for no gain. And see, that's something God never wants to do in your life, which is waste pain. God never wastes pain. If you've gone through pain, if you're going through pain, it has a purpose. What's the purpose? That you would grow, that we would grow through it. But see, with this process, with this progress here, it comes from walking on it. It comes from adjusting it. What does the adjusting? Again, the Word of God. It looks in and it says, oh, I'm going to turn the screw just a little there. We're adjusting something a little bit. You're going to walk on it. I'm going to be the thing holding you up, painful as that might be. That's what gives the growth. And this has been a great process for our family right now. Again, the trust. Will that thing hold him up? Yes. 
The doctor said he can put full weight on it as much as he can bear. It can hold him up. The question is, can he hold up? That's the question. Courage. Will it hurt? Yes. Will it help? Yes. And that's what God's saying in our life so often. Growth, spiritual growth. Will it hurt? Yes. Will it help? Yes. And this is so huge, my friends. The Christian life is often, always, compared to a walk. A walk with Jesus. But remember, growth occurs only in the broken places. And so as we're walking with Jesus, there's going to be a breaking for that growth. Think about it. Think of it in your own life. I don't have to rewind the tape very much to start thinking about the growth spurts spiritually in my life. They've all been surrounded by times of incredible breaking and grinding and pressure and things that I said, I can't take it. And he's like, yeah, but that's because I had to break it. You know, I had to break it. Maybe... Some of the growth in your life has come out of some broken relationships where you say, man, that was a painful thing. Maybe you're broke right now, financially. You know, a lot of broken people there. <laughs> I'm broke. Well, some growth spiritually. Broken health, broken pride, broken self-sufficiency. The list goes on and on. But so often, change in our life begins with that breaking from your past and saying, you know what, I, I don't think I can take it. But that's the very point. It only takes a moment for that birth process that God talked about in our lives. He can do that in a day. He can do that in a moment. He can do it in the flash of an eye. But you know what? It's a lifelong thing for us to learn to trust the Savior in that real practical day-to-day -day way. See, God wants to lengthen and strengthen our faith. That's what he wants to do. And so he's not just breaking it so he can break it and leave it right where it was. No, the whole purpose of any breakage in our life is that there would be a lengthening and strengthening of our faith. And it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. It'll take some time. And you can take courage, and I can take courage in that. Why? Because so often I think, well, this is so excruciatingly slow, Lord. I just maybe have grown this much in three years. And he's like, okay but you're not where you were, are you? And so verse 4, it says, coming to him. See, that's so important. Returning back here to 1 Peter chapter 2, it says, coming to him. That's what it's really all about. That's what the breaking is supposed to get us to. Coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by man, but chosen by God and precious. And you also as living stones. What's he saying there? You, just like Jesus, learning to be like Jesus, are being built up, verse 5, a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but maybe you wonder sometimes. You know, you hear verses like 1 Peter chapter 1 where it talked about us being chosen and precious to God and, you know, that he has ordained us to do a work in our life and he's, you know, done put his finger on our life and said, you, I want you. And you wonder, why is it so hard then? I mean, why did God pick me? For pain? I mean, is that why he picked me? Why has there been so much hardship in my life? Why so much breaking? Well, remember this. Right here, Jesus is called chosen and precious to God. And yet, he was certainly not spared, was he? And so you see in these things, the key to all of this found in the word living stones. See, life, right? Living stones. When you build a building, usually you build it out of stuff that doesn't scream when you cut it, you know? Uh, you, you just, I've, I've done some renovations and stuff. I've never had a rock or a, a, you know, a brick or a piece of wood ever scream out at me, what are you doing? You know, but here it talks about living stones, a living thing. And, you know, church growth, Jesus is big into church growth, but not in the way mankind is sometimes. You know, people sometimes just say, more people, more numbers. Well, that's not necessarily it. See, I like the fact that this church is growing in the most important way. Not just bigger buildings, bigger believers. What do I mean by that? Well, people who are being lengthened and strengthened in their faith. See, I have been a Christian now, I don't even know. Let's see, what was it? 16 years, I think? Sweet 16, is that what I said? Yeah. Well, let me tell you, 
either I wasn't paying attention for the first part of it or things are getting tougher. You know, I am looking around and I am seeing believers being challenged like I have never seen them in my experience. But you know what I see? I see people growing. I see the church growing, being built up sometimes by being broken down in that process. See, what needs to be broken down, he's talking about building up a building of living stones, a real church, a real family, a faith family that really cares about each other and really looks like Christ. What is that going to look like? Well, when you're living with, working with living stones, it's going to be a messy process. Why? Because we all have a lot of walls. We all have a lot of walls. You know, when we come in, we see each other, how are you? Fine. How are you? Fine. Nothing fine about life. You know, but you think about this facade, you know, all in all, just another brick in the wall. That's all I am. You know, I'm a rock. I'm an island. I don't care. I'm not, a, you know, I don't feel anything. A rock never cries and all that sort of stuff. I, that was one of my favorite songs growing up, I have to admit. But you know, when you're suffering, facades fade fast. Can I just put it that way? Facades fade fast when there's real life coming in. And when we're growing through a painful process, it's amazing how well we get to know each other sometimes. We realize we're not a bunch of inanimate objects. You know, you're not just a bunch of uh, folks sitting out there in seats, you know, an audience for a teaching. No, you guys are living stones that God is building into a family here that is loving each other and making a difference in this city. See, we're living stones and we need each other. We grow together and it's so wonderful to know that, that we're under construction. It kind of gives you a different way of treating the people around you. See, Stephen over there, he's under construction, and I hope most of you will give him a wide berth. You know, you're not going to go over there and just like say, hey, how's your leg? Whack, you know, and stuff like that. No, 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 no. Oh, wow, this guy's under construction. And you start treating people a little bit differently when you realize that. You know, that people in this room right now are being chopped and sawed and ground and pounded and all the rest of this. Why? Because we're being fit together into something that's going to look like Christ. And construction zones can be very messy. And so there's something about suffering together that builds a bond like no other. And I can say without a doubt that I am closer to my son, in fact, closer to my whole family than I have ever been before. And I'll say it right here as I've said it a million times. Stephen, I love you. Lynn, I love you. Bethany, I love you. Carissa, you're out there somewhere. I love you too. You're in the children's ministry. But Stephen's my hero, and I mean that. You know, the, my family, a lot of heroes in there. We spent, to me, one of the longest nights I have ever spent. And, and I must have lifted him at least 20 times, we, we would say, throughout a night where we, neither one of us got any sleep for various reasons. I will leave them to your imagination, all the things that he had to do and all the rest of that. But there, not a lot of walls, not a lot of facades, you know, and just holding him. I, I said, Stephen, I'm going to try not to embarrass you, but I'm also going to be a little mushy because I'm a dad and that's what we do. But, you know, just held him and I could feel his heart beating against me and I could sense the frustration and the pain and just the agony that we were going through. And I'm praying for him and he's, I don't know, praying for him. And, I, and I'm praying for me too, you know. He's praying for me too. But, you know, part of being a parent, I thought about so many things those nights. Uh, Part of being a parent, you know, a life as a parent, is, is a series of little deaths. You know, it's a series of little deaths. And what I mean by that as, is as they grow, they go. You know, they go further away and, and they get more and more independent. And, and, and frankly, there's times where I really miss little four-year-old Stephen, you know? There's times where I just miss little baby Bethany, you know, and little bitty Carissa, you know, and all the rest of that. And you miss them. And in some small way, God gave me back... That night, my little boy, Stephen, you know, it was just kind of like whew, just two kids trying to survive the night with God's help. And you love who they are as they grow, but you miss who they were sometimes. And I'll never forget those nights at the hospital. I'll never forget them. They are forever a part of our relationship. Precious, precious, painful, precious times. And our whole family, because of that, closer closer than ever. Bethany and Carissa, man, they stepped up. Awesome nurses. Let me tell you, Bethany, I think, has got more chores than she has ever had. You know, she's got all hers and all his too, and somehow, you know, doing it with a smile. And my wife, you know, two shifts. You know, I had a tough night at the hospital. She had 
tough day at the hospital, a tough night at home, and all the rest that goes with it. But the, the thing I want to think about, too, is not just our physical family. Listen, this church family, my friends, can I say thank you? Thank you from the bottom of our hearts for what you mean to us, what you've done for us, the prayers. I have, I have said this before. I've heard it before. But people who say, I knew people were praying for me. Let me tell you, we knew it. We felt it. It was like a blanket upon us. It was just a, a, an amazing thing. Thinking about this, the youth group here. Think about this. Teenagers praying for other teenagers. Not praying on them. Praying for them. Think about this. Pastor Pedro's kids, you know what they did? They, they called into the prayer line here. His daughters pr- called in, said, on their own initiative, we're praying, we want to pray for Stephen on here on the prayer line. Think about that. Little young kids. And so if you think about this, this church family, again, amazing. But most of all, the most important thing was God was there big time. And if you ever wonder, hey, will I be able? Will I be stable? If I ever have to face what I've never had to face, if it ever gets really, really rough, Will I be able to stand? Not on your own. But the ability for stability, God gives it. And verse 6 here, it says, Therefore, it's also contained in the Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. He who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Verse 7, Therefore, to you who believe, Jesus is precious. But to those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. A stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were appointed. And then verse 9 he says, But you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. See, when I think about this section of Scripture, again, I could talk forever, really, about this section. I won't. But just thinking about a couple of thoughts as it relates to tonight. Special people. That's what he says. You're God's special people. And you think about holy people. And sometimes we think that means, you know, we sit very quiet. And we don't smile. You know, and we don't laugh. And we don't have a good time because we're holy You know, but when he's talking about holy, Jesus was holy, and Jesus lived the abundant life, man. He was familiar with suffering, it says, but he had a joy that people said, where is that? How can I have that? Not because nothing bad ever happened in his life. That's not happiness. You know, happiness is based on what happens, but joy, holiness, man, that's something else. You see, in King James Version, it says, peculiar people. And you know, you guys... We are peculiar people. We cause people to scratch their heads. Without exception, whenever we go to hospitals, they think we're weird. I mean, they do, because we just do hospitals a little different than everybody else. But I think about this. This church is kind of like one big rehab unit. That's why he's basically saying, you guys are special. You all have your issues, you know? I like the way one of the, uh, the family friends, they say a person has SARS, something ain't right syndrome. You know, I don't know what it is, something ain't right. A person has SARS, you know, but we all have SARS, something ain't right. But what is right is that we would proclaim his praises. He says that he has called us out of darkness into light. See, and something happens when people see people who are going through the same thing other people are doing, but they're doing it in a peculiar way. They're doing it in a different way. They're loving God. They're loving each other. And even in the hardest of times, there's a joy, even when it hurts. And that's what it's saying when he says, you'll never be put to shame. I love that. A person who believes in Jesus will never be put to shame. Now, that doesn't mean there will never be shame because of the name. It doesn't mean nobody's ever going to make fun of you or, or say something about Jesus. What it means is you will never be sorry that you gave your life to him. You'll never say, why did I ever do that? The worst thing I ever did was trust in Jesus. You'll never regret him. You'll never be shamed in that decision. And it says there in verse 9, marvelous light. Were you paying attention to the first song you sang tonight? Part of the worship? Marvelous light. I love that song. Fun to play on the drums, by the way. But there that song He's saying it, into marvelous light, I'm running. 
you know, lift my hands and spin around. Just a, a life of wow, abundance. Does that mean it's never going to be hard? No, we learned tonight. As you're running out of darkness and into the marvelous light, it might be on a broken leg. It might be that you're limping along, you know, and, and kind of taking it slow. But in that, God will hold you up. And the important point is not how fast you make it out of that, but that you're headed the right direction. He's bringing us out of darkness, out of shame, and into his marvelous light. And so verse 10, look what it says. Not because we deserve it, but because of his mercy. You were once not a people, but now you're the people of God. You had not obtained mercy, but now you've obtained mercy. That's where we're going to end off tonight. I get the opportunity to teach the second half of the chapter next week, and we'll be looking at some different thoughts there. But I want to just close out by thinking with you the many faces of mercy, the many faces of mercy that were shown to us this week. The first one really has to do with a slide that I'm going to have them put up here. Mercy. Even in the darkest moments, God has a sense of humor. He, he knows the way our family thinks, and we got such a laugh out of this. We look out the window... That's the, that's the bakery across the street from Stephen's hospital room. He looks at it and goes, ow, bone pain. I said, yeah, maybe they need a different name for uh, the, the place. But he actually got his first good meal from that place uh, because the hospital food was part of the suffering. But then you see the mercy again I mentioned it already but the outpouring of love from this church is amazing you know what I am going to go over my over my my uh, my minutes my rollover minutes I even had a whole bunch of rollover minutes and they all rolled over you know so many people called and emailed and text you know my my wife's phone is full the texts are full we gotta empty the little card in it you think about this the mercy you know what this month is? It's March. Now, that may not mean something to everybody, but March Madness. What's March Madness? Basketball. Guess what? My son has a basketball for a brain. It's all he thinks about. <laughs> College basketball playoffs. So what is the prescription of the doctor? Well, you're going to need to walk, but you're going to need to sit around a lot and rest. So Stephen has in his room two TVs in the hospital room. We ended up with a triple room at Jackson. That doesn't happen. Somebody here prayed specifically that we get a good room. Thank you. We got a great one. A triple room with two TVs. He was watching two separate college games like this. His neck is stiffer than his leg, I think, after all that. One of the games you may know about it, Syracuse, six overtimes, made history there. Six overtimes. You know when it got over here? Three o'clock in the morning. What was my son doing? Watching it. Now, I never would have let him stay up till 3 o'clock in the morning watching basketball, but he's there in the middle of the night, hey, wide awake, watching basketball. And this is the, the final one I want you to think about. This one was huge for us. We just, you know, not, Stephen didn't cry, but we did. Okay, but after the darkest night I can remember in my life, that morning, that very morning, Lynn got there, and we're, we had to look through the emails there. We found out that Stephen won an essay contest. Now, he had written this essay a while back, and it was to win four Miami Heat tickets. Guess who won the essay? Stephen. Guess when we got the notification? The day after the surgery. Could have been any other time, but I'm like, I just need one little anything, you know? And the Lord throws that. Poof. We're going to go to a basketball game. Awesome. Weeping for a night, the Bible says, joy in the morning. And, you know, to people who would say Jesus is a crutch, you know, my son's on crutches now, he will be for a while. People who say Jesus is a crutch, you know what I'd say? He is the whole hospital, baby. He is the whole hospital. He's not just a crutch, and I need more than a crutch. I need the whole hospital. And there's a humility that happens in our life when we're able to say that. See, the Bible says we'll either stand on him. He's a stone that we'll either stand on or stumble over. And the last lesson I want to leave with you guys, the last thought is just the love of a son for a father. See, I, I was honestly scared through this. I can say, I, you know, it's not a big part of my personality that I get scared by a whole lot of things, but I was just deeply down scared over sending our son into that operating room. One of the hardest things I've ever done, to watch him get rolled away down that gurney and to know what they were going to do in that room, just to think it through mentally, what was going to happen in there, putting spikes through him, all the rest of the stuff, breaking in, all this but I had to remind myself, man, he's under anesthesia. He's under doctors who care about him. 
They're all trying to minimize his pain. You know, they all have his best interest at heart. And see, I don't want you to walk away really thinking about my son. I want you to walk away thinking about God's son and thinking about this fact here, which is that Jesus went through so much more than that. You know, when you think about it, as bad as that was, you know, Jesus didn't have the anesthesia. He didn't have anyone who was trying to help him. He was trying, they were trying to kill him and kill him in the most painful way possible and putting spikes through him and all the rest of that. And, and as I think of God sending his son to do that, I think, why would he do that? He didn't have to do it. And that's one of the things that has really hit me so hard this week, which is that, you know what? Jesus chose to take my place on that cross. And they use the word for this surgery, excruciating. Excruciating, you know what the root word of that is? The cross. It means of the cross, of the crux. Excruciating. And so the, the standard of pain that we use is we say, looking back to the cross. But this is the point that needs to be made, which is the best a doctor can give you is this process here. Birth, growth, death. Even the best doctor in the world, birth, death, birth, growth, death, that's it. Sometimes not a whole lot of growth in between. But God can, only God can do this. Birth, growth, life. See, it's a matter of life and death, and it comes down to the cross. What changes it? Well, it's the fact that God sent his son for our sin. I said we have a defect. How did it get corrected? Because Jesus paid the price to bring us back into fellowship with God. And there's something about suffering that gets our attention, you know? Sometimes people say, I don't, I don't even think about Jesus, the blood and the, all that stuff. Well, it gets our attention, doesn't it? And God wanted to get our attention because he loves us enough that he knows, hey, we need to make a decision. And maybe there's someone here tonight that as the band comes up to close us out in a song, what I'm going to ask you to do is just we're going to close our eyes, we're going to bow our heads, and I'm going to give you an opportunity to commit your life to Christ. Now, you may say, man, you've, you've made it sound tough. You've made it sound difficult. Well, again, I remind you, the only thing more difficult with, than life in Jesus is life without Jesus because everyone's going to go through pain. The question is, will there be purpose to your pain? Will there be gain from your pain? Well, that can only be said with Jesus. So I'm going to give you an opportunity here, the way we do it, Closing out in prayer, I'm just going to lead you in a prayer. The way you let me know that you want to commit your life to Christ here tonight is simply by raising your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, I want to be forgiven. I want to be heaven bound. I want to have that birth that was talked about here. I want God to send his spirit into my life. I see something in people that have a relationship with God, and I want that. I don't know how to have it. I don't even know what it all means, but I want to do that here tonight. And so I'm just going to ask you to close your eyes. Bow your heads. We'll close out with that prayer. Father, I thank you for these lessons that you have taught me. I thank you for the family, and I thank you for this faith family. And I thank you for this opportunity here that's given freely to anyone in this room who would want to be forgiven by you, who would want to be given the life that you promise. And Lord, just the reality that no pain would be wasted when we give our lives to you. Lord, you took the penalty for our sin. And I pray that if there's anyone here today who needs to commit their life to you, who needs to give their trust over to you, that they would be able to do it here tonight, that this would be their moment. So with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, I'm just going to ask you if you're here in this room, not belaboring the time any longer, just to put your hand up right now and I'll pray for you, lead you in a prayer. I see you back there. God bless you. I see you also. Anyone else here in the room who wants to commit their life to Christ here tonight? Just raise your hand up high. For those of you who raised your hand, I'm just going to say a prayer here. I'm going to invite you to repeat it after me. Father, I thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sin, for my forgiveness. I thank you for giving me eternal life, not because I deserve it, but because of your mercy. And Lord, with this birth, this new birth, let there be growth. 
I want to follow after you all the days of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Again, because of the time, I, I just want to, we're going to close out with a closing song. What I'm going to do is ask those of you who raised your hand or anyone else who senses that they need to make this commitment, just to come to the front as we're doing this song. I want to give you a Bible, congratulate you on this decision, and God bless the rest of you. Thank you for your prayers. Can we all stand up? I will stand, I will stand in your house, O oh Lord, and I will sing of your great love, for I was lost, I was lost, but now I'm found under the mercy of the Good luck.